Great. Well, thank you everybody for being here. It's day six of the California Seaweed Festival. And today we're talking about community involvement and seaweed fun. And we've got a great list of panelists here with me today. Um, but before I introduce um, everybody, I just wanted to announce the winner of uh, for Green Sea Designs. So Green Sea Designs is a company that specializes in seaweed art and seaweed products. And they provided us a $25 gift certificate for their uh, for to purchase any product. And we had a raffle based on the viewers that attended um, the speakeasy and the people that signed up for that. And from our drawing, we found Duncan Jackson as the winner. So congratulations, Duncan. Please email us to claim your prize. So you are the proud owner of a gift certificate from Green Sea Designs. Yay. So with that, I'm going to start on the panelists. And I will introduce, first of all, um, Michael Escrow. So Michael is a marine ecologist with expertise in the application of basic science to policy questions. As the Marine Ecosystems Program Manager at the California Ocean Protection Council, he works with mar marine resource manager managers, tribes, scientists, and fishermen to protect California's iconic kelp forests in the face of climate change. So Mike, if you could tell us a little bit more about your research. Yeah, thank you, Simona. Can you hear me all right? Oh, yes. Awesome. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much for that introduction and thanks for having me today. Um, I've been tuning in to the previous day's panels and they've all been really fantastic discussions. So really, really cool to see so much interest in, uh, in this issue. Um, yeah, like Simona mentioned, my name is Mike Escrow. I work at the California Ocean Protection Council and OPC um, is essentially the governor's advisor on ocean and coastal policy. So we work directly um, with the governor, with cabinet level officials on really um, framing up what California's uh, strategic priorities for protecting the coast and ocean are. And really, I think our, our main role or one of our main roles is to link science to management. So really try to create a landing pad for science so that the research that's going on out there in the water actually has a, a place to go so that we can um, connect the science to policy and to people, right, um, most importantly. So I work, uh, like Simona mentioned, as the Marine Ecosystems Program Manager and the Tribal Liaison for OPC. So that means that I get to work across a, a broad variety of, of areas, um, marine protected areas, of course, kelp ecosystem resilience, aquaculture, uh, tribal engagement, and generally uh, biodiversity conservation. So a pretty broad portfolio, but I can tell you, to be honest, these days, um, kelp work probably takes up 50 to 75% of my time just because it is such a high priority for OPC and for the state of California in general. Um, also because it's really important to me personally. Uh, before I ever got into science or policy, I was a scuba diver, a scuba instructor. Um, so I really, I think, you know, I've always had a, a special place in my heart for kelp forest. Um, giant, giant kelp, macrocystis, more than... Uh, and bulk help, but I've gotten to know and love Neria Sistis as well as I've been working with uh, Tristan and others up on the North Coast. Um, so I wanted to take just a few minutes today to tell you a little bit more about some of the work that California has put on the ground uh, with some of our key partners to try to better understand what's going on with kelp, what are the drivers of some of the, um, the current crisis that we're seeing, and then also what are our, you know, what are our next steps, right? What are our opportunities to learn more and what do we wanna do going forward? Um, so like I mentioned, the protection and restoration of kelp ecosystems is really a major priority for the state. And I'm sure that we'll hear other speakers talk about um, the devastating declines that have happened. Probably everyone in our audience is aware of the 95% loss of bull kelp up on the North Coast. Um, also some, some patchier, but still significant declines on the central and south coast as well. So, you know, we've got that perfect storm, right, of climate-driven factors that's leading to this major loss of, of, you know, species of ecological function of ecosystem services. And so I would say just in the last, I think, year or so, the state has really kind of 
um, moved from more of an issue tracking posture on this to really trying to figure out what can we do? Um, what hope do we have of actually being able to step in and try to solve this problem? And so we've put a few projects on the ground, like I said, that I wanna detail for you today. Um, the first is we're really working to expand our kelp canopy monitoring and mapping. Um, we really need to, to understand where and when kelp is persisting across the state so that we have a better idea of you know, where we might want to take, uh, undertake restoration action, where it's going to be most effective, right? What's driving the factors that, that are leading to kelp persistence? Um, also, we've got a couple of experiments going on looking at urchin threshold densities. So obviously, grazing by purple urchins is a major uh, stressor for kelp forests. We've got big purple urchin population explosion up on the north coast, again, due to that perfect storm of factors. Um, which I won't get into the details here, but what density, if you were going to remove urchins, um, which is a major tool for kelp restoration, what density would you need to get those urchins down to to give kelp a fighting chance at coming back? So we're working on that in North Coast systems and in Central Coast systems. ReefCheck uh, is a key partner on that one. Um, Tristan, I'm sure, will detail a big project that we have going on. This is really something we're proud of because it represents a pretty a uh, unique partnership, I think something pretty unprecedented, at least on behalf of the state, where we've entered into a partnership with ReefCheck, um, with commercial divers, commercial urchin fishermen up in Mendocino County, to have commercial urchin fishermen remove purples at two restoration sites. They've started at Noyo Bay. Um, they'll continue at a second site in the spring, again, to get those urchins out of the system to give kelp a chance at coming back. And Really, this is aimed at evaluating how effective can these divers be. We know they're the experts, right? They're the ones who are out there harvesting red urchin until their fishery collapse. So given their expertise, can they kind of, um, you know, in almost a sort of shifting to more of a green direction, can they help to remove purple urchins to restore kelp forests? Um, we've also got a couple of efforts underway on both, both the North Coast and the Central Coast to determine potential role of recreational divers. So I talked about commercial divers just now. We're also interested in seeing what the recreational dive community can do. Again, ReefCheck, a major partner on this. Um, there's a lot of interest in the rec diving community for in-water urchin culling or crushing or smashing urchins because that can be potentially a lot more efficient than removal. So we're trying to test that out and see how effective it is, see how effective divers can be at getting those urchin densities down. Um, and again, really bringing reef check in as that scientific monitoring partner to make sure we're understanding what the ecological effects are, what any side effects might be. Um, and then lastly, another thing that I'm really particularly proud of, kind of again, sort of trying to change from a more issue tracking research perspective to actually looking for solutions. Um, we've initiated a partnership between OPC, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and California Sea Grant to partner with California's leading kelp forest researchers and form a statewide kelp recovery research program. Um, and so what those projects are doing, there's six of them, are looking at a whole variety of, of different aspects of drivers of the kelp crisis and potential solutions. But really the, the major point that I think is different for this project is the, the, in order to receive funding, the researchers really had to present how their work was going to help develop solutions for the crisis. So, Really excited about all that. Um, next steps, I'm gonna, I guess, tease a little bit that at our February um, Ocean Protection Council meeting, we'll be releasing an action plan uh, for understanding, protecting, and restoring our kelp forests. So that's really gonna focus on what are some of the knowledge gaps that still need to be addressed um, and where are we going from here? I will say that huge priorities for us are continuing to test those restoration methods, and helping to develop kind of a statewide kelp restoration toolkit um, that includes an assessment of where and when different methods might be most effective, right? Where might you want to deploy commercial divers? Where might you want to deploy recreational divers? Where might you want to help, you know, feed some kelp with, uh, with green gravel, for example? Um, and at a scale, ideally, that makes a difference. So while we're testing these methods, we're also helping to restore if ocean conditions are favorable. Um, of course, engaging stakeholder communities as we go and really trying to strengthen our, our meaningful partnership with California's Native American tribe. So I think I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions when we get to the Q&A, but that's sort of um, where the state of California is on kelp. And, and we're really grateful once again for this opportunity and, and for all our partners, especially. 
Awesome. Well, thank you. That sounds like you're doing some incredible work, obviously linking that, you know, scientific research with restoration efforts and policy and, and having that, uh, you know, important communication is, is super critical. And that's how you really get, get work done. So looking forward to hearing more about that. So also for our audience, if you have any questions, please add those to the chat um, in YouTube and we will get to those after the introductions. So I next I'm going to introduce Terry DeSelke and she is the owner of Ocean Harvest Sea Vegetables. So this is a company that specializes in ethically hand harvested and sun dried seaweeds from the Mendocino coast. Terry is also an educator in the Ukiah School District where she teaches about nutrition and gardening. So Terry, we'd love to hear more about your work. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So good afternoon. I'm honored to be here with all of you. Much gratitude to Janet, Simona, and Elizabeth for bringing this festival to all of us and inviting me to present today. Uh, like Simona said, my name is Terry DeSilke. I've been an educator in the public school system for 38 years now. I currently teach science. Just a second, we're having some technical difficulties, so hang, hang in there. Just one second, we're trying to make this better for, for audience viewing. So if you just bear with us, we will carry in just a second. the interruption and would love to hear more from you, Terry. Go ahead. Thank you. And I do live in the middle of the Redwood Forest, so the bandwidth issue is an issue. Um, I've been an educator with public school system for 38 years now. I teach science to elementary students and their teachers. My career as an educator has been magical and very rewarding. And I'm telling you about being an educator because I want to talk to you about taking you out on a class and foraging seaweed. Um, among the many hats I've worn, I started a countywide nutrition um, school garden program 20 years ago, and I'm still continuing to oversee that program in seven schools in Ukiah, as Simona said. Ocean Harvest Sea Vegetable Company has been in existence since 1981, and it came my way in 1999 when I moved to Mendocino County, and I purchased the company. This sacred calling to provide nutrient-rich first foods to people is one I take very seriously. We hand harvest wild seaweeds in an ethical manner so as to preserve the harvest habitat, har harvest habitat and bring delicious and nutritious seaweed frond tips to people. We honor these tribal lands as sacred and is used for millennia as subsistence harvesting by the Northern California tribes. We're always open to dialogue with and deep listening to the original inhabitants of these lands and Oceanside. Much gratitude for this deeply cared for resource. When harvesting, we sing songs to the ocean as the grandmama of all life. We give thanks for abundance and for our safety. I'm honored to have the ocean as my office during the new and the full moon low tides from April through July. We harvest for probably about 25 two hour sessions each year, sometimes as early as five o'clock at the ocean side. <clears throat> Most of the time there are two of us, sometimes three, we're able to carry between two, between 80 to probably about 150 pounds on our backs from a harvest site, that's of wet seaweed. And this makes our wild harvest a little over 2,500 wet pounds a year. This dries to about 250 dry pounds for storage. So divide that between 10 types of seaweed and we store between 10 to 50 pounds of each type for a year's supply. We call it a small cottage industry because we're all limited in supply by weather, waves, locations, drying ability, and the capacity to carry that wet seaweed up the cliffs. It's hard, rewarding work. <clears throat> So I invite individuals and families to learn to forage seaweed safely, as well as identify seven to eight different types of edible wild seaweeds on our northern coast. Here's a rundown of what you can expect on a foraging adventure with us. 
Everyone in our small group of 10 to 15 people brings an offering to the ocean. We walk to the water's edge at dawn or early morning to adventure together and learn. We sing together and make our offerings. We talk about safety among the waves and how to count and track those waves. One person can forage up to 10 pounds of wet seaweed a day without a license, which is about one reusable grocery bag from maybe like a Whole Foods or a co-op. I do suggest that you collect it in smaller bags that you can identify with a marker for when you get home to dry your seaweed so they're not all just tangled all together. Only those with a seaweed harvesting license can harvest sea palm. It's the one regulated seaweed. It's unique to the Northern California coast. I show you how to cut the frond tips, leaving the reproductive parts of the algae. We talk about specific seaweeds, the three colors of seaweeds and how to identify them, as well as the nutrient content and how seaweeds reproduce by spores. We spend about an hour of our two hour low tide at our first location, hurrying to safely collect the four to five different species of seaweed there. We then travel north to another harvest site to continue our foresting, foraging and education. You collect another two to three species here. We end our foraging adventure in a circle, learning how to dry our seaweeds at home and how to store them so they last for the year. I serve some food made with seaweeds as well as let everyone try the dried crunchy seaweeds so that you know the, the, um, the consistency that you wanna get your dried seaweed to so that it will store for a year. We end our time with recipes, questions and answers as well as a picture of our group. In my class, I like to use the analogy of a lock and a key when you're thinking about nutrients from foods, especially wild foods. And I, I picked this up from my herbal teacher, Donna Deterra in Willits. When you eat conventional foods or mass grown foods, the lock in the nutrients in the food is hard for the key to open. There's a struggle until your body finally is able to open the lock and absorb the nutrients that might be there. When you eat organically grown foods, the lock to the nutrients is easier to open. You might need to jiggle a key in the lock, but it opens and the nutrients are released in our bodies. When you eat wild harvested foods, the lock to the nutrients opens immediately. And these wild grown nutrients are able to be accessed by the body in an optimal way, therefore nourishing us in ways that our bodies crave. The elation that follows a seaweed harvest is like no other. It's so special to soak in the ocean's negative ions and restore our own body's watery fluid. That elation might sometimes come from knowing you can safely navigate the waves and the slippery rocks up the hill with your backpack of seaweed safely. If you're interested in the 2021 uh, foraging classes, which will most likely occur in June and July, please email me through my website which is seaweedmermaid.com. There's an email form there. You can also email me directly at oveggies at pacific.net. That's spelled O-H, like Ocean Harvest, veggies, V-E-G-G-I-E-S, at pacific.net. And indicate that you would like to be on the 2021 foraging invite list. Thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. Awesome. Well, thank you, Terry. I've been on, you know, lots of foraging um, as well as diving uh, expeditions in Mendocino, and it truly is beautiful. So um, this sounds like, you know, you're doing some fun, fun and nutritious work. So we we will take questions for that after um, after our next uh, introductions. So next, I'm going to introduce Nancy Caruso. And she's also been dubbed the kelp lady. Nancy's a marine ecologist and founder and executive director of Get Inspired. This is a nonprofit that mainly focuses on kelp and abalone restoration in Orange County. Or, um, Get Inspired also organizes citizen science projects and restoration projects in Southern California. So this, uh, this organization aims to inspire stewardship by involving community and restoring our kelp forest ecosystem. And also Nancy um, has put together kelp festival. So we'd love, or kelp fest. We'd love to hear more about that. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Simona. Thank you to everybody. 
involved in the seaweed festival. I couldn't be more excited to be here. And um, luckily there was a way to put it on virtually. So I'm very grateful. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Nancy Caruso. I'm a marine biologist and founder of Get Inspired, which is a nonprofit organization based in Orange County, California. And I'm gonna tell you about how we have fun with seaweed. <laughs> Lots of fun with seaweed. Uh, our mission is to inspire stewardship and curiosity for the natural world through the exploration of science. And I'm going to share with you, uh, we have several different projects that we're working on, but I'm going to share with you today our Orange County Ocean Restoration Project, because that has the most fun with seaweed. So we are actually restoring several species along the Orange County coast. I've been working on kelp restoration and kelp forest restoration uh, for the last 18 years. And I'm working right now on the, the kelp itself, uh, white sea bass, green abalone and pismo clams are the species that I'm working on in particular. And um, I'm always looking for stories about these species. So for the green abalone and the pismo clams, especially since it's been a long time since they've been in great abundance. If you have any stories you'd like to share, uh, please call me or email me. I'll give you my contact information at the end uh, because I was not around when those species were ever, ever abundant. And so what I know now is all from people sharing those stories with me. Now, kelp forests are extremely important to us, as you all know, because you're here at the Seaweed Festival, but 800 different species rely on them, and we are one of them, of course. Uh, thousands of consumer products made from kelp. They, they are carbon sinks, they produce oxygen, all things that we're becoming more and more made aware of because kelp is so popular right now, thank heavens. Uh, state of the kelp um, in California is kind of dismal. And um, we, we have a big problem going on on the North Coast at the moment. But in 2000, uh, that's when I came on the scene and started working with kelp. And uh, at that time, the Department of Fish and Wildlife reported that kelp densities in Southern California were down 80%. Now it's flipped and that's kind of what's going on in Northern California. And according to aerial surveys in the year 2000, Orange County was the worst off. We had lost 90% of our kelp and it had been gone for nearly two decades at that point. So um, we didn't jump on it right away. We didn't do restoration right away. And I got to see the results of that with basically no fish uh, along our coast. I did fish counts and, and algal counts and invertebrate counts for a decade. And until we got the kelp to come back, there was no place to count the fish uh, except in the rocks. So um, I, have, I have lots of data that show that kelp is really, really important to having diversity along our coast. The reason it disappeared in Southern California is actually different than in Northern California. And we don't really, we can't really pinpoint it to one thing, but ecosystems are so dynamic, it takes a lot to, to collapse an ecosystem. So in the, in the case of Southern California, we kind of puzzle it together by talking about all the things that happened over a hundred years in Southern California. And it, it, a lot of it had to do with us building our civilization along the coast, but we have a lot of human inputs. We have, you know, 7 million people living along um, Orange County and San Diego County. So turbidity got high. Uh, kelp doesn't grow in deep depths anymore here like it did in the early 1900s when it was mapped out for the first time. It's growing in 100 feet of water. And now it only grows to about 40 to 60 feet, depending on where you are. Um, of course, we lost the otter in Southern California. That was a big uh, thought to be keystone species. Uh, we're kind of revisiting that now that we're looking at them in Monterey with the collapse of the kelp forest. Uh, but we lost the otters in 1880 here in, in Orange County. So we didn't have those for a really long time. And then we had uh, overpopulations of, of sea urchins. And we had also been commercially fishing lobster and sheephead. So it's just a lot of different straws on the camel's back that finally collapsed during the El Nino of 1983, where we had 50 foot waves coming up over the tops of the Huntington Beach Pier and we lost a big pier in, um, in Southern Orange County. Um, it was the biggest El Nino in recorded history. And after that El Nino, we had lots and lots of kelp 
but unfortunately it was all washed up on the beaches. So our kelp forests were dwindling up until that point. Um, we Luckily down here in Southern California, we have aerial surveys. I know Mike was talking about getting those done up in Northern California, but we've had them here in Southern California for the last 40 years. So we can look back at all the data and see the kelp dwindling after decade after decade. And then 1983, basically it disappeared and it was gone until 2000 when the Department of Fish and Wildlife said it's, you know, 80% gone. And then NOAA funded a project, which I got to be part of. And we started the Southern California Bite uh, community-based kelp restoration project. And to my knowledge, it's the biggest kelp restoration project to date. It was involving um, four counties, including Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, Orange County, and San Diego County. And uh, there were four biologists. We were all working together to grow kelp, teach volunteers how to plant it, teach kids how to grow it, and then plant it back in the ocean. And um, we didn't publish anything, but there's lots of reports. So if anybody needs kelp restoration data, be, be sure to contact me for all of the reports and the state of the kelp reports that we produced. So I worked on kelp restoration from 2012, 2002 to 2012 outside of the NOAA project. Um, I actually got laid off several times during that term because of funding issues, but I ended up starting to get inspired so I could finish restoring the kelp. I had trained almost 300 volunteers and they were all very dedicated to having fun with kelp and planting it. So um, I started up my own nonprofit organization to be able to finish it. I taught 5,000 kids to grow kelp in their classrooms. And uh, some of them are now phycologists. I have a, a student of mine that I taught when she was in middle school. She's now graduated with a, her master's in phycology. Yay! Uh, this is a little system that we grew kelp in in the classrooms with the kids. And uh, it really it really stuck. The kids were really excited about seeing their process or their progress uh, taking place in the ocean. And we planted all these kelps on little tiles and they grew. It was amazing. Uh, but we needed a little help from the ocean. You can't do it all. Humans don't have all that power. So we needed the La Nina of 2009. It took me seven years to get kelp all the way up to a canopy. And it was the La Nina of 2009, which this year is a La Nina. So I'm hoping for some good kelp growth. But we had lots of urchin barrens. Our reefs were covered with purple and red urchins. We had red urchin barrens too in Northern um, Orange County. And we basically were permitted to remove them and dump them in deeper water. And then we planted kelp that was grown in schools and in our regional laboratory. All of my students were required to go out in the community and teach about what we were doing because it's an invisible project, right? There's not a whole lot of people that dive in the ocean and they don't notice algae. They don't notice kelp unless somebody tells them how beautiful it is and how important it is. So this was a big part of the project was to really involve the community. And in September 2009, that one right after that La Nina that brought our kelp to the surface and we were having parties and so excited, there was a huge south swell. And in Orange County, that means a direct hit to our beaches. And a lot of kelp got washed up on the beaches. And the city of Laguna Beach called me and said, we just had the worst Labor Day weekend, because they're a beach community, in our entire economic history. And it's because the kelp washed up on the beaches. And you have to come explain to our city why this is a good thing. And I said, what? Are you crazy? So I went into the city and I explained that the kelp was important and I brought in pictures from 1903 and it looked just like this, the way it's supposed to look. There's kelp on the beach. And uh, what we didn't know at that time was that was the beginning of the Great Recession. And they blamed the kelp for the Great Recession. That's the funny part of the story. But what came out of that was that I realized I had forgotten to educate the Laguna Beach residents. So we started Kelp Fest in 2010. And the community was then involved in celebrating the return of the kelp forest. And we were trying to foster an appreciation for them. So all of my students would put on interpretive dance and paint paintings and, and have live music all centered around kelp just to bring people closer to this slimy green algae is what everybody would call it, uh, or, or seaweed. And we did that. Now there's Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts involved. I mean, who doesn't love Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts? That matched with kelp. Everybody loved kelp. 
And of course, art was a really big part of that. You can convey lots of information with art and getting people to love kelp involved lots and lots of art. So that was very, very successful. Kelp Fest still lives. Uh, the Laguna Beach or the Laguna Oceans Foundation now runs the Kelp Fest. And now we have a new threat in our kelp forests. Sargassum horneri is a, an invasive species from Asia and it has come in to our kelp forests and I've been monitoring it for the last um, 18 years watching, actually it came to Orange County in, in 2006. So I've been watching it for the last 14 years. And uh, this year I'm hoping that our kelp will uh, be able to return to the reefs after the El Nino and the disruption of the warm water uh, blob. But I'm, I'm, I'm kind of doubtful. So I'm petitioning the Department of Fish and Wildlife to allow citizens to help in the effort to alleviate this pressure on our kelp forests. Um, I have a petition going through the Fish and Game Commission. If anybody's interested in helping with this effort, send me an email. I need lots of letters and public comments um, uh, to make this a reality, but it, it looks as though our kelp is being hampered because this, the sargassum has already recruited. It's already covering the reefs and shading out the potential for kelp to recruit this winter. So um, I would really love to, the opportunity to remove it and the Department of Fish and Wildlife is protecting it in our MPAs, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, I also do other restoration projects like sea bass, white sea bass restocking. I have uh, had over 3,800 kids raise them in schools. This is in partnership with Hub Sea World Research Institute. We release fish twice a year during a normal school year. Uh, we've released almost 1,600 fish. And I'm also restoring green abalone. Um, I've, I've had over 1,600 kids growing green abalone in their classrooms. I have about uh, well, I'm waiting to find out, but I have 5,000 of them growing right now and another 2 million at settlement. Uh, we just had a very successful spawn um, two months ago, so I'm waiting to see how many we get from that settlement. Uh, but lots of kids involved, lots of volunteers involved in this program. Uh, I've trained 150 volunteers to go out and help me with outplanting and monitoring. And so it's, it's super exciting to keep the community involved and have fun with our kelp forests. And I know that is the whole theme of this talk today. So in closing, kelp forests are open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year with more than 800 species on display. And it doesn't cost anything. I love our public aquariums, but go check them out. Go swim with them, go kayak in them, go snorkel in them, go diving in them, and go love them and speak out to protect them. Thank you so very much for, for letting me talk today. And if you'd like to help out in any way, please contact me. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Nancy. I, I don't think anybody can be not inspired after hearing you talk. Uh, it's, it's great. Thank you so much for sharing about your work. So last but not least, we've got our last panelist, Tristan McHugh. And Tristan is the North Coast Regional Manager and Restoration Program Manager of ReefCheck. She leads monitoring and research of North, Northern California's temperate rocky reefs, as well as their recently launched Kelp Forest Restoration Program. So we'd love to hear more from uh, Tristan. Go ahead. Hey there, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. My name is Tristan McHugh and I live here in Northern California. I'm based in Mendocino County. Um, just a little about myself and what kind of brought me here. I have a background as a research diver um, and a marine ecologist throughout the Eastern Pacific, but I've always loved the ocean and I think that's something that really drew, drew me to it initially. And um, just the vastness of the ocean, just how incredibly exquisite the characters are within it. And I think, you know, given that this is a community session, um, the intimacy of getting to share that place with the people that I love most and the people who made that area so special to me. And so that is really what, you know, totally solidified my love for the ocean was just those amazing experiences that I had growing up, um, going to them with my family. So I love algae. I mean, 
just as, as a blanket statement here, um, when I heard that there was a California seaweed festival, I was beyond excited to know that there were other aficionados within the crew here. Um, and I, I can't say that I've always loved algae, but going diving in central California, I, the first time I went, I was just mesmerized by the towers and the trees, um, the underwater forests that were right there. And I had no idea how, again, exquisite they were underwater. And so um, as I began diving, I really just became amazed by the house in itself and what the kelp forest did for the number of species like Nancy had mentioned. Um, and it, it's the home. And so I kind of reframed my thoughts. I thought I was into fish, I'm still into fish, of course, but the fish are there because of the home being kelp. And that is what I chose to do my master's work on. So I went down to San Diego and studied how storms impact subtitle red algae communities when you remove a canopy like kelp. And that was also occurring at a time right about when we had these really, really warm water events happening in the whole Eastern Pacific for that matter. And so seeing kelp deteriorate at a time when we were thinking about it, again, was this very um, profound and very intense kind of experience to really say, hey, like what, what is the role of this character on earth here? And the more I dug into kelp, the more I just fell in love with it. And so um, anyways, did my master's work on, on kelp, um, and following graduation, I wanted to keep diving. I wanted to stay involved with the public because I do believe that public engagement is key to really um, creating this ecosystem together, right? Like creating this really beautiful way of thinking about how the world works. And so that's what brought me to Reef Check California. And um, Reef Check, as an overview, is a nonprofit NGO that focuses on monitoring reefs all over the world. So we have programs that study coral reefs, and then we have temperate rocky reefs, temperate being cooler water, and rocky reefs um, here in California, reefs made of rock as opposed to coral. And so the whole goal of um, Reef Check California is to go out and monitor these sites um, every single year using volunteer citizen or community scientists. And in Reef Check, um, there are three regional managers and we have a few um, volunteer coordinators now, which is really exciting, but the regional managers and our small team survey over 120 sites throughout the state every single year, again, with volunteers. And we gather baseline data where within that baseline, we're counting the fish, the invertebrates, the algae, um, the habitat, the sand inundation, all, all those sorts of metrics. And recently we've started um, oceanographic mo monitoring. So looking at temperatures. And that was of course driven by um, the events happening earlier um, in 2013-14 as worms, warming waters started to present themselves and pose a threat to the resiliency of kelps. So with all of that, um, my goal here in Northern California is to get the community involved and teach them to do the monitoring protocols and species identification and really collect this critical information in a region that is quite poorly understood. And that's of no, no one's fault, but it's a very challenging place to work. It's the water is cold. Um, it's logistically challenging to go diving here. And just to, um, we, we don't have a dive shop now. It recently closed. And so there are, there are reasons as to why this, this area is notoriously challenging to collect baseline data in. Um, but all that being said, the local community has really stepped up their game and this was obviously due to some massive changes that have happened within this region, specifically being kelp loss and a population boom in purple urchin. And so um, in, um, I can kind of allude to um, why we're now in restoration, but before that, um, in 2013-14, there was this, um, sea star wasting disease that kind of appeared all of a sudden or seemed to appear all of a sudden. 
Um, with that, at the same time, there is this big population boom of purple urchin. And then similarly, around the same time, we got a warm, wa warm water blob event and then El Nino event. And mind you that in Northern California, um, the otter was exterminated back in the mid 1800s. And so with the la lack of predator redundancy, the ecosystem was pushed into this other state from kelp forest to urchin barren. And so we started to see tons and tons of you know, adult-ish sized purple urchins moving into the near shore environment, pushing abalone, um, eating kelp, just pushing everything um, and creating this purple urchin dominated state. And mind you also that purple urchin are native species to California. So it posed this very interesting question nonetheless. Um, so all that being said, community members wanted to do something. They saw the abalone were being pushed out of the way. They saw kelp disappearing and wanted to get involved. And so there were a number of events that were um, put together by the Waterman's Alliance to go and coal or harvest urchin. Um, there, and that was in partnership with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and many other folks um, up here in Northern California. And, the question still loomed of, is it working or are we helping or are we hurting? And that is really the nexus to which ReefCheck got involved. And so around the time that these efforts started happening, um, we were one of the groups that lived here locally to go out and dive and put in some restoration sites where these efforts, or not restoration, sorry, monitoring sites where these efforts were taking place. And so that has been um, that was my job for the past couple of years was just keeping track of you know what we were seeing on the ground underwater and communicating that outside of our community to let folks like Mike know what was happening here in Northern California. And so um, earlier this that all kind of snowballed for a while. A lot of people did a ton of amazing work, and fortunately, in earlier this year. The Ocean Protection Council granted reef check funds to begin doing active restoration in Mendocino County. Um, how am I doing on time, by the way? Um, I think you know we're 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 kind of running out of time, so maybe we wrap up and then we will have yeah. some questions if you don't mind. Thank you so much. Of course. Um, and so. I think with all of that, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions and this is a work in progress that we're doing, but in summary, commercial urchin divers are now physically removing urchin from the reefs. Um, one targeted reef here in Northern California, reef check is monitoring before and after those efforts. And we're also going ahead and looking at all of that catch to see what is happening biologically with the urchin and, the, and finding avenues for those urchin to be used so nothing is wasted. Um, all of this is a super, super incredible collaboration with um, the state and I work very closely with Mike and James Ray from the department and the fishermen. So if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Tristan. So I just have a follow-up question, um, and and thank thank I you know all the panelists touched on some different aspect of this, but um, you know in terms of um, how this community so so with reef check I've actually done some of that monitoring myself back maybe 10, 15 years ago, and and it's definitely a rough rough place to dive, so it's it's no joke but it's also incredibly beautiful. So how is that data being used? Uh, you know, all the, the I, you know, you're collecting the citizen science data and then how is that applied to, you know, these restoration efforts that we also heard Mike talk about? Yeah, so basically <laughs> this is how I've, since starting this job, um, we have these baseline data that we collect and we have a whole suite of it happening every single year. All of this data is open access. So um, if the public wants to use it, all they have to do is go on our website and get the data. Um, and that it could be used for any organization, grad students use it, 
um, the Nature Conservancy's used it. So there, there are applications to that. But I think more explicitly, um, we have our finger on the pulse here. So we, we have eyes underwater. And so when folks like Mike um, wanted to know like what it was looking like, you know, we'd get on the phone and we would, I would kind of unpackage that data. Um, for him and for others in the management realm, go to public meetings, um, go talk to the community. And so that is kind of the application of the data that we collect. Okay, thank you. And I do, there are some follow up questions about urchins um, in the area. So uh, this is for you and uh, for Mike. Do you expect the urchin density threshold to vary? much by urchin species, so purple, red, or crowned? Um, I, Mike, do you want to take it or do you want me to answer it? I can start. Yeah, you want to maybe you start and I'll, uh, I'll follow on from there. Sure. So crowned urchin, um, we don't see those up here in Northern California. Those have been not saying it couldn't happen, but we haven't seen them yet in Northern California. Um, the difference in densities between purple and red urchin, I think, is a very fascinating subject. As you know, when we started to see um, very early on kelp loss, purple urchins were moving into the system. However, as time goes on, we have seen red urchin dominate in certain areas in certain pockets. So I think it's it's context specific, um, and that is the importance of you know, understanding these cove by cove mechanisms or these these local mechanisms that kind of feed into our grander perspective of how it works. And mind you also, we've been harvesting in these areas for quite some time. So humans are a predator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's perfect. I mean, the, um, the only thing I think I'd add to that is that from the management perspective, you know, obviously red urchin are a uh, harvested species, right? They're an important fishery. And in fact, the Fort Bragg red urchin fishery, I mean, Channel Islands elsewhere in the state uh, was huge. Um, if anyone has ever eaten uni, I mean, you've been, been from California, you've eaten red urchin potentially from the North Coast. And so we really need to uh, you know, understand how, if we're trying to restore a cove, for example, and we take out all the purples, but then reds move in, what do we do with that? Um, it's, it's a complicated question because reds do potentially inhibit kelp regrowth. However, they're a marketable species. And so, you know, especially because our partnership with the commercial red urchin fishermen is so important, we want to make sure that we're respecting, you know, the fact that that is, um, that is their livelihood that we're, that we're looking at. So we're, you know, again, it all comes down to the data. So when we reach tough management questions like that, that's when I get on the phone, you know, or my boss tells me to get on the phone and talk to Tristan and say, okay, how many reds are actually out there, right? What are those densities? Do we, you know, are we observing, um, like we observed on the, in the reef check density experiment on the central coast, reds actively moving in after the purples, uh, you know, are, are crushed or removed. So um, it's a tough issue with the reds, but we are sort of actively grappling with it right now. Nice. So with, uh, I'd like to follow up uh, and pose this question to Nancy, given your experience with, you know, two decades of, of, of kelp loss in Southern California and what you've seen there with your restoration efforts, what would you recommend for the North Coast? Nancy? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I have I've shared this information with Tristan um, because I think the, the number one uh, lesson learned uh, from all of that work down here was persistence in funding uh, is necessary. So Mike, that's your job. Uh, keep, keep funding coming uh, so that all that work can get done. Because it literally, it took 12 years for us to do that here in Orange County. And, and LA County is still working on kelp restoration. They started in 1998 and they're still restoring kelp there. So, and Wheeler North started in 1960 in, in Los Angeles County. So it needs to be an ongoing thing, not just as Wheeler, Dr. Wheeler North told me in 2003, you don't just walk in and take out a couple of urchins and plant some plants and turn around and walk out and call it restoration. So uh, persistence is the number one key factor. And the number two thing was that um, every, Cove, like Tristan said, every cove, every reef is going to require different 
uh, mechanisms for restoration. And, um, and we did that here. Everybody who was involved in the project was doing it differently and we were all reporting back to one another, but all of my individual, I had 15 restoration sites and all of them required something different. And it just took trial and error and throwing things against the wall. And, and that's why there was no time to publish anything. So I caution everybody to, to not just study because studying takes a long time, but to have applied work going on on the side so that you can keep running things through the mill to see what works um, in a short term rather than you know, waiting for results on the long term. You can have that going on the sidelines, but, um, but persistence and keep trying different things to see what works in different places. Thank you. So Terry, you have a bit of a different angle um, talking about, you know, edible wild seaweed foraging. And obviously um, the, the kelp loss has probably impacted, I would assume, your, um, your foraging. Can you speak a little bit about that? Um, are, are you being more selective for a certain species? Are you maybe harvesting some invasives or something like that? So just curious from a harvester's perspective, how does this play in? So we have harvested bull kelp in the past, um, but every different seaweed species uh, grows in a different place. So we're very careful to watch what's growing, where, how it's coming back the next year. If it doesn't come back, we don't enter that place. And I'm talking more specifically about uh, the sea palm or the kombu or wakame, um, not specifically the bull kelp. We have seen just this past summer, uh, bull kelp canopy that we haven't seen for years. So that is encouraging. I hope it's not an anomaly and just a one-off. I hope that the, it is coming back. Um, but as far as that affecting the different other species of seaweed, I don't really see the connection um, when I'm out there. Since I've been there since 1999, most of the spots that I harvest are abundant every year. And like I said, if they're not, then we don't enter them for that year. That makes sense. Yeah, so to follow up on that, there were some uh, questions about red algae or for example, rotoliths. Um, do the urchin barrens or, you know, do you see that the urchins are grazing um, on the red algae as much? Um, and, and also what about, you know, other, other species of seaweeds? Do you deal, how do you approach those? I guess this is more for, for restoration and thinking about the North Coast. Um, so I think just rotoliths are a very interesting, like we could go for days about rotoliths. They're in a camp of their own, but we don't have rotoliths in Northern California, but I will speak to what we're seeing at the restoration site, which is that um, urchin love kelp, kelp brown algae. Um, if, if there's like a small amount of kelp available, even though there's a ton of red algae available, um, they, I mean, in our situation, we have like small, tiny bull kelp recruits coming up and we have some red algae around, but the urchins will go for the kelp. Like that is, that is the thing that they want to go for. Um, but that being said, there is this really cool study being done by um, UC Santa Cruz students that found that they actually love detritus, which is like the broken down version of kelp as opposed to the live kelp. And so I think it is this larger, like big picture question, but Nonetheless, like any algae can, will be eaten if it's available and nothing else is available. And even speaking to what we see in the stomachs of the urchin that we pull apart, um, if they are, if there isn't that fleshy algae around, they will also eat the calcified algae, like the crustos coralline, the stuff that's like stuck to the reefs. They'll chew through that, um, which is a bummer because that's like an abalone magnet. So. Um, that's why we do want like algae of any kind to really protect that most foundational baseline of like the hierarchy in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm gonna, you know, there, there's lots of good questions coming in. I'm, I'm gonna change the topic just a little bit. Um, there was some interest in the kelp vest 
and how it came to be. And our audience was also interested about the interpretive dance of kelp. And I just want to say something about that. We did uh, just an hour ago have uh, kelp or seaweed yoga. So there was some interpretive dancing. So if anybody wanted to see that, um, you know, check our archives. But I'll I'll let you, uh, Nancy, talk a little bit about the festival that, that you've had over the years. Uh, well, as I said, the, the point of the festival was to foster an appreciation for kelp uh, because it was, it was not done as, as we had moved along in the process of, of growing it. So essentially it was all about flashy, flash dance kelp and <laughs> interpretive dance and song. And, um, and it was put on essentially by the students I was working with every year. So I'd have 1500 students or so making posters and making banners and creating arts and crafts and Girl Scouts had booths there that were, um, you know, had games and arts and crafts about kelp. And um, Wyland came down a couple of times because his studio is a block away and he would do kelp drawings. But it really was a kind of an art festival and, and that was about kelp because that's the best way to convey it to the public. Um, I, when I work with students, especially students who say, I don't like science, they're, they like art. And I said, well, that's great because that's the best way to convey science is through art. Everybody gets art. You, know, you see, see this beautiful picture behind me. You can, nobody can deny that it's gorgeous. But if I showed you a piece of kelp, you might not think the same. So, so that was the crux, that was the, the basis of, of Kelp Fest was to bring about that uh, awareness and appreciation. And it was done through many, many different forms of art. Awesome. And so with that, I also just want to ask Terry, I know um, in your bio, you, you, there's, uh, you talk about educating uh, students about gardening and things like that. Do you also incorporate any seaweed science into your education to the Ukiah school districts? Well, I have done uh, presentations at the Heirloom Seed Expo in the past about how to use kelp uh, uh, as a liquid fertilizer in the garden and the results about um, my tomatoes growing almost twice as big when I use the kelp versus when I did not, the plants and the uh, fruit. I have not actually done any um, education with the students about the kelp in the garden, but I do uh, seaweed explorations with them so that they can try out the seaweeds. They can see some underwater videos. They can get to know the seaweeds a little bit. They can feel them. Um, so we do a little bit of education of the seaweeds themselves. Awesome. Thank you. Another question from the audience, is there a garum on the North Coast? And given that it's chemically defended and the least preferred kelp of urchins, if it is present, how is its abundance changed as Nereocyst is declined? And so maybe uh, thinking about Desmarestia also, you know, acid weed, is that persistent, you know, because it is more chemically defended? And do you see that? Yes. Um, so I've seen agarum um, and agarum, for those who don't know, it's like the coliander um, seaweed. It's, it's just like a giant blade with a bunch of holes in it. It looks really cool, but um, we do see agarum, um, but it's mostly, I haven't seen it at subtitle depths. I've seen it in the inner title um, a bit more, but very rare, not like abundant. Um, as for Desmarestia or other chemically defendable algae, I think this is a very interesting thing to think about um, and work that researchers have looked into, which is chemical defenses in places with apex predators, right? So thinking about Northern California, there was um, an otter here at some point. There, there were a lot of other predators here um, that could have potentially kept um, urchins at bay, right? Keeping that trophic hierarchy. Um, and so the algae didn't need to spend the energy to create those chemical defenses because they're being protected by that trophic um, interaction. Um, all that being said, that's, that's kind of like one angle of thinking about it, but we do have Desmarestia, which is acid weed. And even, you know, mind you, my baseline of like this, this system started, you know, a few years ago when there was no other algae, just like some of those more opportunistic Desmarestias. 
And I saw like urchins just like tug of warring across that puppy. Like they'll go for it um, regardless of, you know, their vacuoles having less than one pH, right? So I think it, at anything's game at this point. I've seen urchins eat plastic. So let that. <laughs> you need sargassum up there, Tristan. You need sargassum. Oh, <laughs> <We're> <laughs> game changer. <laughs> Our urchins coming not, for you. <laughs> sorry, what's that? I said it's coming for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, did, are you saying that urchins do not like sargassum, or are you just referring that it's 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 a weed and it it'll it'll provide some food? Uh, they they don't seem to go after it like they go after the other brown algae. Um, there's been some studies, I guess, where they'll they'll eat it if they have to. Um, but we don't see any big clearings of, of sargassum from urchins down here, that's for sure. Great, so uh, we're, we're gonna wrap up soon, but I just wanna pose a couple more questions that came from the audience. Um, again, talking about urchins. So in the case of green urchins in the North Atlantic, their destructive grazing seems to be driven by urchin behavior rather than th threshold density per se. Is it their roving in large aggregations when drifting kelp detritus becomes scarce that results in mass kelp consumption? Do you think that purple urchins may impact kelp similarly or not? So, um, sh sh North Coast question or anyone can. Well, I was just going to say Tristan, Tristan's the expert, so she should go for it. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of try to lay out my understanding and then Tristan can correct what I get wrong. But um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, I think that they're linked, right? So when urchins are present in high densities, um, then they eat more and there's less drift kelp. And when there's less drift, less drift kelp, um, they sort of shift behaviors from being, Tristan and I always talk about good little urchins, right? Good urchins are sort of nestled in cracks and they eat the drift kelp that floats by. That's what we want to see. I mean, we've talked a lot about purple urchins as a villain. Um, and I don't know to what extent I believe in ecological villains, but in some sense, maybe they are on the North Coast right now. But also they're a native species, right? And in their proper ecological niche, they're part of this whole system. They have been forever. Um, so they're not, you know, completely evil, just the ecosystem's out of balance. When an urchin is being a good urchin, it's sitting in that crack and it's eating drift kelp and, you know, everything sort of fits together. But when there is no drift kelp, because those densities have gotten so high, I mean, it's kind of a feedback loop, right? Where then the urchins come out of the cracks and they go storming all over the reef to try to find live kelp, um, kelp that's actually attached that they can graze on. So that that's my understanding is that they're very much correlated, but um, Tristan, yeah, curious to hear or your interpretation. No, that was right on. Um, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, sometimes it's like the good urchin, bad urchin, of course, like Mike and I talk about that a lot. And um, I think that is one thing is that we, we've thought to like demonize the urchin, but the urchin is just reacting, right? The urchin is reacting to this much larger global issue that is happening. And you know, one thing to remember is that this this phenomenon of urchin encroachment, like whoever asked this wonderful question about North Atlantic urchin, um, there, you know, I, I've done work in the Aleutians on different species of urchin and they're, they're urchin in New Zealand and Australia and Norway, just all Japan, all over the world. This is something that happens when an ecosystem, like Nancy was saying, is pushed into this other state, something much larger then the urchin is at force here. The urchin is just responding. And so I think that's always important to keep in mind, especially when it's not an invasive species, it's, it's a native species to this place. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Of course, they are responding to this bigger issue that we have climate change and how it's affecting the kelp and, and throwing species out of balance. So, you know, I think that's why it's so great to see all the efforts in California to, you know, to, to make this better, to, to try to re restore the system. And um, other than that, obviously everybody 
needs to talk to their policymakers, needs to vote and, and really get that going too, because that's super critical as well. So uh, just two more questions. How can people get more involved with seaweed and uh, are you having kelp fest next year? Uh, I wanted to jump can... in. Oh, go go ahead, Nancy. Okay, uh, it, that's COVID pending, uh, like everything else that's going on next year. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, but Kelp Fest has a Facebook page and a website, so just keep an eye out. And you can contact me if you live in Orange County to get involved with seaweed. Go ahead, Mike. Well, I just thank you for that, and I also just wanted to follow on something that Simona said about voting. Um, Nothing that I do matters unless I'm staffing folks who actually care, right? So I can care as much as possible, but if the governor and our council, um, the state legislature, if those people don't care, or if they have other priorities, then nothing I do makes any difference. So, and we're really lucky in California to have, I mean, in this administration and in our legislature right now, we do have a lot of ocean champions. So make sure they stay there. Vote for people who are going to, you know, I don't want to get political, but at every level up and down the ballot, vote ballot. Vote for folks who you think are going to help to champion your ocean-related causes. Um, yeah, because because otherwise I can't do my job. And I think in other ways, you know, it's a big problem um, that I think can seem daunting for folks. So there's big ways and small ways to get involved, right? Voting, I think, is a big way because you're influencing directly what happens in those halls of power. Um, also, I mean, reducing carbon emissions, demanding climate solutions, everything that we're talking about today, this, this all has roots in climate change. And so we're never truly going to be able to get to a place where, um, you know, we're, we're back in kind of that, that uh, state that makes sense, that ecosystem state that we're used to until we fix climate change. Um, and to some degree, that's going to involve adaptation, right? Adapting to sort of a, a future that's different, a baseline that's different, but, you know, preventing it from getting any worse. And then on kind of the more, um, I guess, community-based level, since this is about community involvement, get involved with organizations like Reef Check. I mean, get out there and actually start collecting data. If you're a diver, you can collect data underwater. You can participate in some of those urchin culling or removal events that I talked about. If you're not a diver, download iNaturalist. And get out of the tide pools and participate in Snapshot Cal Coast. Help track how you know some of those intertidal algae that Terry mentioned. Um, are doing or join water quality uh, monitoring events. There are a lot of community-based water quality monitoring things that happen after the first rains, for example. Folks will go out there, um, citizen science, community science-based efforts to measure water quality, measure nutrients, and we know those are things that directly impact kelp health. Um, so I think there's, yeah, both just want to make the point big and small ways to get involved. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any other last comments that you'd like to put out there before we wrap up? I think um, just on on kind of like the back of what Nancy and Mike um, echoed, just immersing, like spending the time to go outside and taking the time to build a relationship with nature is how you kind of unlock all those other gateways. I think spent, you know, that is the one thing that is, I know it's really daunting to think about all the other things that you can get involved in, but just if you're trying to start somewhere, start at square one and just go outside and start picking apart algae, separate them by red, by brown, by green, pick up all your inverts, put those in piles, you know, that that is probably like the simplest and most like interactive thing that you could do for yourself and for, for your loved one. Yeah, and I think Terry mentioned that as well, like going out you know, foraging and, and working with, with folks who can kind of lead you and, and show you around, point out all the, um, all those things are super important. And, you know, that's also kind of, uh, you know, you can social distance out there and <laughs> it's, it's pretty safe. You're outside. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much, panel. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and get us all inspired about seaweed and restoration and we wish you all the best um, to continue doing your awesome work and we hope to have a live event next year and we hope to see you there so thank you again thank you so we're gonna wrap up and there's just a little uh 
concluding video at after we finish this panel. So stick around for that. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Take care. Hello, Seaweed Festival enthusiasts. I'm Simona Gite. I'm Janet Kubler, and we're here in our backyards again to uh, thank everyone for this wonderful Seaweed Festival, California Seaweed Festival we've been having. So we couldn't have done it alone. We'd like to thank our, our uh, community. Hello, Seaweed Festival enthusiasts. I'm Simona Gite. I'm Janet Kubler, and we're here in our backyards again to uh, thank everyone for this wonderful Seaweed Festival, California Seaweed Festival we've been having. So we couldn't have done it alone. We'd like to thank our, our uh, communication staff, <laughs> per se specifically our uh, technology guru, Elizabeth Burns. You've been so fantastic with running the show behind the scenes. We'd like to also thank Julia Marsh from Sway for your fantastic graphic design, as well as Leslie Boer for all kinds of technical expertise. We also wanna give a, a big thank you to the panelists for um, present they're all your presentations and just uh you know fantastic conversations as well as our moderators who've done such a good job getting people engaged and um, asking fantastic questions and then behind the scenes translating the questions we had from from one platform to another we had steve dudgeon and a team of students from csun and i'd also like to thank uh, tech support from from CSUN, uh, Tim Aguirre, who has been helping us out behind the scenes. Uh, we have a lot of sponsors of the event that we need to thank. They are uh, some institutional sponsors, CSUN and Yukon, California Sea Grant, uh, Sway, Sunken Seaweed, and some other ones that Simone is going to tell us about. <laughs> so we'd also like to thank our three new sponsors, Marnie Jackson, Monterey Bay Seaweeds, and Nature Spirit Herbs. And if you are uh, so inclined, feel free to sign up for a sponsorship. Uh, this will help keep the festival going for the next year and for years to come. 
and we are so looking forward to next year already. So it has been a wonderful experience bringing the California Seaweed Festival to life and we are uh, excited for what we can do next year. So look for us in the new year sometime to get in contact and tell you what's going to happen later. Yeah, and feel free to watch. All our videos have been archived. Um, follow us on social media. Reach out to the panelists. You know, if you have questions, there's contact information on our website. And we hope to see you next year. And thank you for tuning in and making this a success. Enjoy your seaweeds. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.